Thanks so much. That was quite the introduction. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. And thank you to Google for hosting us and Sam for being our host today. We really appreciate it. Um, as many of you are probably aware, um, since 1990, over a billion people have moved out of poverty globally, which is really exciting and I think gives us all the idea that it's possible um, and that we can make significant progress on our goals towards ending global poverty. At the same time, nearly a million people still live in poverty. Um, and many more than that live without access to financial services, live without access to health, and live in chronic and acute hunger. Um, and those people are disproportionately women and people living in rural areas. And so at Grameen Foundation, we're really committed to continuing to find solutions that work for those people. Um, many of the advances that have driven global growth, um, that have driven the, the reduction of poverty have been global growth, but there are also many advances that have been due to, to um, investments and development initiatives. So, for example, in India, some of you may know the Andhar system, which is the, um, the new national identity um, and biometric system in India. Many, some of you may have worked on it. Um, but India has made a significant investment in making sure that every person in India um, has a national ID and that that national ID is connected to their biometrics so that they're able to access that at any time. Um, national identity is a significant issue for poor people. Many of them don't have identity. They don't have a birth certificate. They don't have any sort of government documentation. And without that, they're significantly limited in their ability to open a bank account, in their ability to access government services, in their ability to be recognized, in their ability to vote. Um, and so for India, making the commitment to establish this national identity and connecting it to biometrics has been a significant um, investment and a significant advancement towards their end to poverty. Once people are in the system, they're able to access their government benefits. Um, they all automatically have a bank account that's open for them, so their government benefits transfer directly from the government into their accounts without having to pass through other hands, which makes, which makes sure that they receive all of their benefits. And the development of that system was a development initiative. It was funded by the Gates Foundation in collaboration with the Indian government um, and many other development initiatives. So um, another one which many of you may have heard of um, is M-Pesa in East Africa, which is a mobile money uh, system connected to the Vodafone system there. <laughs> so although only 15% of Kenyans have a bank account, over 90% of Kenyans use a mobile money account connected to their mobile phone. Um, and randomized control trials have verified that over 6% of people annually move out of poverty because of their access to um, mobile money. And there's several reasons for that. One is that it increases their resilience. Um, if somebody has a health emergency, for example, they're able to reach out to friends and family near and far to see if they can gather resources to cover that health emergency rather than having to sell off, say, a productive asset in their household, having to sell a cow, um, which may be worth $100 just to pay for a $6 uh, health emergency, you know, needing malaria medication, for example. So they're able to increase their resilience through their social networks, through the mobile money platform, um, and able to retain more of their assets. Um, for women, it's an important resource, too. They're able to save and save somewhere often that is more private um, and away from, say, their husband or other family members who may want access to their resources. So for women in particular, having a safe and private place to save is a very important part of their um, ability to have more control over their own resources. We live in amazing times, and with this technology development, much of it happening here at Google, and many of you so hopefully involved in some of it, we're seeing big data. Um, the use of cell phones, um, being part of just a host of disruptive technologies that are transforming the way we work in the developing community, the way that we engage with partners, um, and giving us really unprecedented opportunities to make impacts on poverty. At Grameen Foundation, we're really passionate about disrupting global poverty. We're working to create breakthroughs that will reach many of those still living in poverty. We design strategies that equip women and their families with knowledge and services. We really look at how we engage with frontline workers, people who are already engaged with poor households to improve their ability to deliver products and services to them. And we bring together partners in an ecosystem. So we work primarily with software companies, with private sector entities, with governments to ensure that solutions we develop are embedded in sustainable delivery mechanisms, whether that's sustainable private sector initiatives or sustainable government initiatives. Many of you may know Grameen Foundation. 
see, I think I got ahead of myself on the slides. Um, through our history, we were founded um, in 1997 through the work of Mohammed Yunus, um, a Nobel laureate for his work as the father of microfinance. His breakthrough idea was really that that poor women were someone you could invest in, that you could lend to them, they would invest that money in their businesses and that they would repay it. And we really have um, grown on, on the back of that um, idea that poor households are good investments and someone you can do business with. In our first 10 years, we really focused on microfinance and developing microfinance institutions globally. But in the last two, 10 years, we have built on that foundation. We've really focused on using digital technology to develop sustainable solutions to reach the poor, especially women. Today, our mission is both urgent, but also hopeful. It's urgent because 60% of the chronically hungry people are still women and girls. They're disproportionately affected by poverty and global hunger Though global poverty is on the decline, global hunger is on the rise. Two billion people, more than half of them women, have no access to formal financial services, which is key enabler to life. More than 100 million people are driven into poverty every year because of a health crisis. And that's not a developing country phenomenon alone. That's a phenomenon here, right here in the US. And maternal mortality rates in Africa remain virtually unchanged over the last three decades. So there is an urgent need to continue to invest in finding solutions to global poverty. At the same time, we're hopeful digital technologies are offering unprecedented solutions, things like human-centered design and, and private sectors increased focus on working with the extremely poor provide opportunities that we've never had before. Looking forward, Grameen Foundation is looking to reach 25 million people over the next 25 years um, and move them sustainably out of poverty. Today we work in three main areas. We work in digital financial services for women, we work in uh, digital innovations in agriculture, and then we work in health, health financing and access. The health financing and access is primarily connected to our work, particularly around financial services and agriculture. I wanted to highlight a couple of our programs that I thought you guys might be particularly interested in. The first one is um, called the CAN Network, the Community Agent Network in the Philippines. I think everybody's familiar with the Philippines. It's an island uh, nation. It's made up of over 7,000 islands, which it makes it extremely expensive and, and time consuming um, for people to access financial services. And it makes it extremely expensive for financial service providers to build out infrastructure across all of those 7,000 small islands. So we have worked with um, women like this, with Joan, who are small, uh, what are called sorry, sorry shop owners, kiosk owners. They run little small businesses, they, smell, they sell daily household items. And we have worked with a technology provider to um, equip these women with uh, what we call a point of sale or POS device that enables them to, to um, do mobile money and digital payment transactions for members of their community. So now Joan, who was on a small island in the Philippines, is able to be the intersection point for her island and for her community for people people to pay their electricity bill, for people to make a deposit or a withdrawal into their bank account. Um, and this is enabling financial inclusion to reach these small islands and people who've never had access to it before. Um, to, to date, we've trained over 18,000, or sorry, 1,800 agents, 75% of them women like Joan. Um, we cater to 423 low-income neighborhoods across this island nation. We facilitated over 4.3 million transactions valued at 1.3 billion pesos. So there was a huge unmet demand for these types of digital financial services. And as soon as we were able to put an access point in these communities, um, you saw the, the amount of people who were using digital uh, mobile money really uh, ramp up. The other uh, project we're engaged in, which I thought you guys might find interesting, is a project we call SAP for Farming. It's a project that just launched this year, and it's part of our global partnership with Mars, which is the chocolate company, um, makes most of our, our candy bars these days. Um, and in this project, we use satellite digital imagery um, and data to reach 240,000 smallholder cacao farmers across Ghana to help them increase their yields, um, improve their incomes, and build stronger businesses. And what we do this the way we do this is taking some of the precision farming techniques that have been developed in the developed world for use on large, uh, large scale farms and large industrial farms and try and take some of those technologies and those techniques and make them work for smallholder farmers. So things like satellite imagery to help um, understand whether, sorry, um, soil conditions and whether soil needs additional nutrients um, to understand if soil um, needs, if your farm needs more or less water 
during any particular point of view. Um, you can use satellite data imagery to understand whether the pruning on a particular farm um, has been done correctly. And weirdly, pruning is very important for cacao trees um, and helps improve their productivity. So making sure that it's done correctly is, is an important thing. So we work with um, Mars and, and some of the, their partners on the ground who have these field agents, um, extension agents we call them, who already go out and interact with the farmers. So we're able to use satellite imagery and um, satellite data to provide information to the extension agents so that when they go out and visit a farmer, they can tell them, you need to improve your pruning techniques. We can see that, that your trees need to be pruned more. Um, we can see that uh, your soil is low in nitrogen and you need to plant additional plants in order to increase the nitrogen and um, nitrogen in your plants. And so it's really taking that technology that's already in use for these large scale farms and figuring out how we can use it to increase small scale farmers productivity and the, their income. And many people don't realize that cacao farmers are some of the poorest um, people in the world, even though they're connected to this global chocolate value chain. There are high levels of child labor in chocolate globally. And so Part of this work that we do is not only improving their productivity, but bringing these farmers into a global digital system. So their information gets, um, gets into our system for each farm, their farming practices, um, et cetera. And then we are able to work with them to become fair trade certified, um, to become organic certified if that's what they're looking for. So it's a system that gives both greater profitability to the farmer, but also greater visibility for all of us into the global chocolate value chain. And, um, it's something that we're working with Mars in, um, in looking at blockchain as the kind of next part of that so that as consumers, everybody can have visibility into how your chocolate products through Mars are being produced um, and whether they're fair trade certified, whether they're absent of child labor, et cetera. So I know that that's something that um, kind of both sides of the coin can benefit from. One cornerstone that's um, consistent across all of our projects is our desire to really use data and information to track our programs. We're, uh, I think in the developing community, still at the at the nascent stage of figuring out how to use big data and some of these big data sources to really bring to the fight against poverty and hunger. Um, but we're trying to use these smart tools and the, the data and the information that we have on smallholder farmers to bring them more fully into market systems and to overcome some of their their challenges. Um, one of the things, for example, that we're looking at doing now, um, we have worked with hundreds of thousands of smallholder farmers globally. One of the biggest constraints that they all have is access to finance um, because they don't have a financial history. Many of them don't have bank accounts. Um, many of them haven't worked with a, a mainstream or large financial institution before. They may do all of their lending and borrowing locally through their community or through um, money lenders. Um, so how can we help this data that they've built up in our system? We may have three to four years worth of their farming data. Um, we may know exactly how much they've spent, um, invested in their farm. We may know exactly how much they've produced and what they've earned off of that production um, for two or three years. So how can we help them take that data and turn it into a credit profile or a credit score that they can then use um, with the mainstream financial institution? So we've already done some of that in Colombia with coffee farmers, and we're looking to replicate it in uh, Ghana with, uh, sorry, in Uganda with co coffee farmers, and then in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire with these cacao farmers. So we think that's something very exciting um, and a real um, growth area for us and an area where we can really use the data that we already have to really make an impact. Um, I think there's other exciting ways we can start to think about using technology globally to alleviate poverty. I talked about blockchain. Um, it's something that we're all trying to figure out what the best way to use is um, this new technology um, and ways that it can help impact poverty. One of the ways that we're thinking about at Grameen Foundation is particularly with refugees as they cross borders and are receiving health care, say in a country that is not their own, how can they develop a health record on something like blockchain that helps them as they, as they move globally, whether they repatriate to their home country or whether they're moved on to a third country, how can they take their health records with them? Something like blockchain is something that can really be um, very helpful with that. Um, we're experimenting with artificial intelligence and augmented reality, um, particularly in our India office. We've been working with Accenture development partners um, and using artificial intelligence. For example, we do a lot of financial literacy training. So using artificial intelligence to help us understand how much women have understood and internalized the training that they've received and where women need additional support uh, to ensure that they, they understand uh, 
how to use financial services appropriately. So I've actually done it myself, done the little Q&A, um, and it's very interesting to get the, the readout and the report on, uh, on how you're doing and how well you're understanding the lessons that you just received, so it's, it's exciting. Um, and another exciting area we're looking at is remote sensing for agricultural ir irrigation. So again, it's something that's, that's being used by large-scale industrial farms in developing countries, but can we use remote sensing um, to help smallholder farmers in India um, use water more efficiently and water more effectively? So that's a project that we're just uh, at the beginning of. So I'm going to end it with that, um, and I'm really happy to answer any questions anybody has or talk a little bit more about our work. We at Grameen are very excited about the ability to use technology um, and information uh, to end extreme poverty and hunger. We think these can help create the breakthroughs that will move women and their communities out of poverty in a sustainable way. And we think it can be helped with the work that uh, you know, people at Google are doing. So we're really excited to talk with you guys today more about the work we're doing um, and hear more about if you guys think you're working on anything that's that's relevant or could be adapted. Um, we're really excited to hear about it. I will say that my colleague B is over here, so if you want to sign up for our newsletter to learn more about Grameen Foundation, she's the one to see. Um, but with that, I'll end and see if anybody has any questions. I'm just curious about uh, where you see the intersections of Google's work and um, development, so anti-poverty or um, anti-hunger efforts or job training or other uh, you know, significant efforts that'll have an impact on, on social well-being. Yeah, I, I think probably you know the uh, Google.org or World Philanthropic uh, Arm because they work with nonprofits and, and uh, Jacqueline Fuller, I mean, she really understands a lot about that. I think that they, this, actually I, <laughs> I met uh, with Jacqueline in uh, Reno last week so I think that they, they definitely are a good point to point of contact. The other thing is that we are working, or myself, I work in Google Developer Relations. We do technology and we work with developers. And uh, we have these trainings around the world with but focus on social impact. Because of course we work with big companies all over, but this is based on social impact and we are part of Grow with Google, which is becoming a global initiative. In the US, Europe, India, Indonesia recently launched in Africa as well in Nigeria, in uh, Google for Nigeria. So in addition to these developer trainings, we do like uh, internet in railway stations, digital skills training, many of the things that, that you were talking about. I mean, just getting people increase their ability to get employed. And uh, that's what we do. So of course, we are part of Google Cloud Platform which all the technology is there in terms of uh, whatever. I mean, we have the cloud. So interesting, I mean, we can probably follow up and see if we can figure out if we can collaborate in some way or another. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That would be very exciting. I think especially with some of the skills training um, pieces, that's something that we're always being asked for. Uh, so uh, do you see any do you see the problem of global poverty getting worse with like desertific desertification and loss of arable land basically due to global warming and climate change? Absolutely, and I think it's, it's very geographically specific. So, and there are parts of the world that are being impacted differently. So, for example, you see areas like Mozambique or the Philippines that are being subjected to much more frequent natural disasters. So Mozambique, for example, um, is, is much more frequently being hit by typhoons or significant rains that are causing flooding, that are causing crop loss, that are causing loss of life. So we're seeing those issues hit some countries. At the same time, we're seeing other countries, particularly kind of the Sahel region countries where increasing desertification um, is you know, encroaching on areas that were former bread baskets um, and that were producing significant amounts of food. So there are different impacts everywhere, but without a doubt, particularly the developing world, is being disproportionately impacted by climate change, and they are disproportionately not contributing to climate change. I guess, I guess the actual uh, the question to the foundation is, uh, are you doing anything to try to prevent that from happening? Like, is it easier to prevent people getting into poverty because of those than 
trying to pull them out of it afterwards, after the fact. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the, the projects we've initiated, for example, in the Philippines is an early warning system. So it's both a weather and a pest early warning system. So one of the things we're seeing with climate change is very different pest patterns globally, right? Because um, mosquitoes are one that a lot of people, it's not a, it's not a crop pest, but you know, mosquitoes are coming into areas that they've never been before because the climate in that area has changed. So similarly with crop-related pests, they are coming into areas where they've never been before, where farmers don't know how to deal with them, um, and, as well as weather-related risks, particularly in the Philippines. So in the Philippines, we've worked with both the Ministry of Agriculture and a local university that has a that runs the weather stations um, in the country um, to develop an early warning system. So that early warning system sends information to farmers if there's an inclement weather event or if there's a pest outbreak in their area. And not only does it tell them about the event, but it gives them instructions. So for example, if there's, if there's a typhoon coming, it may tell farmers you need to cover your, your trees in burlap. It may tell them you need, to, you need to harvest early because there'll be total crop loss. You should harvest what you can now. At the same time, it allows for um, two-way communication. So say a farmer finds a pest in their crop that they're not familiar with. They can take a picture of it. They can send it into the system. They can receive information back on what to do about it. But at the same time, it will triangulate. So if several farmers in, a, in an area report the same pest, it will then send out a warning to all farmers in the area that the pest has been spotted in their area and how they should treat for it. So early warning system is something that we're working on, that we've piloted in the Philippines. We're working on in, in agri integrating it into uh, this Ghana project I was talking about and, and other projects. So yes. Thank you. So that may have been way more detailed than you wanted. <laughs> can, can I add to that a yeah, little of bit as well? So farmers are the majority of the world's poor. 70% of the extreme poor are farmers. So a lot of what we do is in terms of helping those farmers increase their productivity and the sustainability of what they do, which is part and parcel of adjusting to climate change. So I don't know if you want to maybe talk a little bit about the savings groups work, like in, in Burkina Faso and how we're directly doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I think climate adaptation is, is a big issue. Um, and it's, it's both a financial issue and it's an agricultural issue. So in Burkina Faso, we work with women who, and a lot of times, particularly in Africa, you'll see that men are often engaged in what we call cash crops. So they, they grow a crop, crop that can be sold at market, and women are engaged in household food crops. And so we engage women in Burkina Faso in savings groups, so they, they get together on a regular basis, they save weekly, usually a very small amount, um, and they, they're able to pool that savings then, they can borrow from it if they need um, for an investment, um, but at the end of the year then they receive their savings back and they're able to invest in it. So as part of that project, we worked with those women on understanding the impacts of climate change in their region and helping them to modify or adopt, adapt what crops they're growing. So we worked with a lot of women, for example, to start growing cowpeas or um, cassava or, and different kinds of um, orange GMs, which are much more drought resistant and, and tolerant given the, the changes that are happening. A lot of times what happens, particularly in these rural communities, is that people have been engaged for generations in farming a certain type of crop. And they really understand that crop. And as climate change happens and they need to move into crops that are going to be more appropriate given what their new climate reality is. They don't have that level of skill and understanding of that crop. Um, and so hel helping them have the information on what crops are going to work for them now and how they should grow it and how to harvest it, et cetera, is an important part of our work. And then making sure they have the resources to invest in it. It's very risky for smallholder farmers. You know, um, I, I, Cassava is one of my uh, the things I dislike most in this world um, because it's a very drought resistant a crop and it grows almost everywhere. So a lot of people have a lot of incentive to grow cassava because um, it will come in no matter what and you're, you will be able to feed your family on it. It is a very low nutrient. Cassava is like a yam, um, kind of a yellow yam, but it doesn't have the nutrients that yams do. Um, and particularly for young children, it's hard to digest. So you, you see young children who eat a lot of cassava actually <laughs> tend to be more malnourished than uh, even though they're they're getting a lot of calories because they can't digest them very well. They, they tend to be extremely malnourished. So, but people plant it because it fills bellies. 
And so if we can give people the information they need on other crops that will do as well as cassava, but will have much more nutritional benefit for the household, like yellow and orange sweet potatoes, um, like cowpeas, which are extremely drought resistant, if we can help them to understand these new crops that they can be using, which are readily available in their areas and how to, how to harvest them, not only will they you know, potentially have a better harvest, but it will be more nutrient rich food for them. Um, I was wondering about mobile financial services and, and device security. Like a lot of these cheaper Android devices basically never get security updates. Um, have you found any practices that help protect people if they're acting as like the financial agent for their whole village of, of keeping their device secure? Yes. <laughs> um, I would say that device security is probably pretty low on a lot of people's priority lists. Um, what is high and where I think we're seeing a lot of momentum is moving people towards uh, better, more and better smartphones. Um, so you see a lot of people still, most people, particularly in Africa, are still using, well, Africa, India, most development countries are still using feature phones. So the big push is to try and get people onto smartphones um, and to get people more access to data. Because um, even when people move to smartphones, data can be very expensive still. So the short answer to your question is not really doing a lot on device security. Are, are feature phones like more resistant to malware than, than typical? Uh, low-end smartphone? I, I, I don't know, anything I don't know the answer to that. My guess would be yes, only because it doesn't have very many features. <laughs> you know, they don't have very many features for people to mess with. Um, and usually then when you're using a feature phone, you're using um, USSD or SMS technology to access your accounts or do, do your transactions. So. Um, hi, I was curious about something you said about uh, using blockchain for uh, medical records. I was curious what makes that specifically a spe uh, that technology specifically suitable for that purpose versus you know some other database platform or some other system. Yeah, I think one of the things that makes blockchain interesting in that particular use case, and it's it's one we're still exploring, we haven't implemented yet, um, is the ability for those records to be transferable across borders and to be accessible through biometrics. So if a person um, you know, returns to their home country, a lot of times when people, uh, when refugees cross borders, they don't, take their you know, they don't have do documentation with them, so they don't have their national IDs, et cetera. So the ability to build biometrics into that and to make it accessible when people cross borders are what makes blockchain particularly interesting in a lot of these cases. I'm sort of a, like you should only, I think a lot of people are very bullish on blockchain, and I'm also bullish on blockchain, but. I think people want to use it a lot of times when you could just use a regular database. And so, and there, <laughs> there's, so there is, um, and so, you know, I've heard people tell me, even if it's just a regular database, go ahead and put it in blockchain because that's where the world is moving. Um, and then other people have said, you know, it's, it's a complicated technology. If you could just use a database, just use the database. So we're probably still on the just use the database side of things, but. And people are thumbing me up, so I'm, just, I'm hoping that's the right answer. So I'll try and ask loudly, some mics over there. Um, what's, uh, you talked about the amount, the wealth of data you guys have collected. Well, what's your view on um, making that data publicly available for people to help you gain insights from? Yeah. So I'll just repeat it in case. Uh, the question was, what, because we have such a large amount of data, what our position is on sharing that publicly. Um, which is a good question and I have a good answer because I was just meeting with our tech person this morning. Um, so we're in, we have a huge amount of data in different systems. So we're going through a process right now of cleaning that data. I think we're very open to sharing it um, in a couple of ways. One, we're open to anonymizing it and sharing it widely so that people can do research with it. Um, we're also open to sharing it in, in ways that allow people to provide services to specific farmers. So for example, we have a lot of farm data in Uganda. And we are working now actively on making that accessible to financial institutions so that they can identify farmers who need to invest in their farms and lend to them. What we are um, quite specific on is that that needs to be a relationship that the farmer understands and, and agrees to. So say um, Centenary Bank is one of our partners in Uganda, which is a large bank, national bank. So say Centenary Bank wants to access a farmer's data to see if they want to make a loan to them. That the farmer either needs to receive an SMS and say, yes, I consent to 
to Centenary, or the farmer needs to be able to push their data. So they, the farmers talk to the Centenary Bank, they want to send them their data, they can push it from the system. So the, there needs to be a consent process where the, the end user um, is able to consent. Because when we originally collected their data, we didn't understand, uh, you know, some of them may have started five years ago, we didn't know what, what we could be doing with it. They didn't consent at that time to sharing it widely. Um, going forward, um, you know, we may have different kind of consent protocols, but I think it's important. And, and this gets back to the blockchain thing a little bit. Um, poor people don't understand all of the things you could be doing with their data and where their data could be going. And um, e even if you, if they sign a consent form, does, is that really meaningful consent if they don't understand what we're all talking about with this big data stuff. And so how can you make their data available but still give them some level of control over it? We talk a lot about, particularly because you know we work sometimes in refugee situations, what are people's rights to anonymity, right to be forgotten, um, and what are the dangers that go along with people's data being publicly available? So um, anyway, it's something we think a lot about. Um, so I grew up in farming in Florida, and a lot of the industrialized techniques that we had were kind of made sense because of economy of scale and heavy equipment and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> how much of of that industrialized techniques, how many of those apply, and have you looked into uh, any sort of research with more specific techniques, smaller techniques? So that all depends, um, and I'm going to say I'm not an agriculture expert, um, but so things like data for farming is something that you can parse out pretty e easily and cheaply. Um, other technologies like um, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think. Um, like there's a lot of work that's been done, not necessarily by us, but like around um, cooperative ownership of technology, whether that technology is a large um, the word I'm looking for? Harvester. Harvester, there we go, thank you. <laughs> um, or, you know, other machinery, you know, cooperative ownership and cooperative movements are big in developing countries as well as in the U.S. Um, but data, I think, is something that can be parsed out to the individual farmers so that they can take action on it. So to, to add on to that, I do think even in the developing world, farm fragmentation is an issue we deal with. Um, particularly because of climate change as, as arable land is shrinking in some areas. Um, you know, you have a farmer, he has so, so much land, he has three sons, it gets divided among the three sons, they have three sons, it gets divided. And so there is a consolidation process that needs to happen in the developing world. Um, and it's a lot uh, of what we talk about um, and gets to maybe some of the skills training opportunities because there needs to be off-farm rural enterprise that can pull labor off of farms um, and allow for farm consolidation in a lot of countries um, to make small holding farming more profitable. Hey, as as somebody as somebody at Google who you know mostly spends time, you know, thinking about consumer technologies and sometimes enterprise technologies in in the developed <laughs> world, um, I am curious, you know, what what you've seen out you know in in the developing world as far as interesting or surprising uses of technologies that we've developed here, you know, big products like, like Gmail or, you know, Android phones or, you know, contacts and address book is, is the, the area where I work. Yeah, what, what have you seen out there, you know, them, them using the products that we've developed in, in interesting and surprising ways? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think it was interesting. I lived for seven years in Tanzania. I came home about two or three years ago. And I was amazed how many people here don't use WhatsApp. Like in, the, in East Africa, WhatsApp is the primary mode of communication. And WhatsApp is now being used and piloted for mobile money transfers. So, um, so I think there's a lot of interesting things that are happening in developing countries that aren't happening here. It's interesting, I went to um, one of those like aha moments for me. I went to one of these women's savings groups in Kenya um, and we had worked with them uh, with a partner bank, um, and so they were they had a savings account um, on their on their mobile phone that they could deposit into. And so I was asking the woman, um, one of the women in this group, okay, you, you have a savings account. What's the account you want? You know, what type of financial product do you want next on your phone? You know, do you want access to credit? Do you want insurance? Do you want agricultural credit? She said, just put them all on my phone, and I'll decide what you know what I want to use. So the hunger for these tech solutions is really is really really high. I talked to a woman 
same day um, in a different group who said, God, I had to turn Facebook off on my phone because um, I was just using it too much. And this was, I had flown on an airplane to a secondary city. I had driven an hour. I had taken a boat across a lake and gotten to this rural community. It was like a four hour trek to get there. Um, and here's a woman telling me, I use Facebook too much. I have to turn it off because it's distracting me. So the hunger for technology <laughs> is really, really high in these communities. Um, and there's, I think, sort of this myth that a lot of these communities aren't very tech savvy, but um, they're really um, taking up a lot of this technology. Thanks, and I and I have a, another question too. As long as I'm up here, you go for so it. so Google is is full of idealistic people with software engineering skills. Um, if one of those people, you know, hypothetically, wanted to put those skills to work, ending world you know ending world hunger or, or poverty, um, what what are the opportunities that are out there, um, you know, on either volunteer or full time basis or or whatever? One of my colleagues will be so excited that you asked. Um, we have a program in Grameen Foundation inappropriately named Bankers Without Borders um, because it started in our early days when we were focused primarily on microfinance. But it is a volunteer program that lets working professionals volunteer their time, um, either here from the US, providing kind of remote assistance, or traveling to a developing country um, to work with a local partner for you know two to three weeks. Um, and so it's a volunteer program, and we work with our partners in developing countries who have needs for assistance and with uh, professionals here to try and match them up. So um, if you see B, she'll get you some information. And anyone else who wants to volunteer their time, um, get you some information on the Bankers Without Borders program. And you can sign up. And some of it's as, um, as untime consuming as, say, we're working with a small business in East Africa that um, is thinking about using a technology in a certain way. And they just want to have a brainstorm session with some people, and so they'll set up an ideation session, Grameen, uh, Bankers Without Borders will, um, and maybe try and find you know five or six professionals here in the US or in Europe who can just sit in, on a you know, Skype call or a, a WebEx and talk through with the CEO kind of what technology might fit his needs. Um, and then it could be everything from, we have people who do, do you know, year-long fellowships funded by their employers um, you know, to sit um, you know, in a partner and really work with them in depth over the course of a year and then everything kind of in between. <laughs> so if you're interested in volunteering, definitely look at that pro program and sign up for it. It's really, it's really amazing. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. I'm gonna let the Google guy go first. <laughs> uh, I wanted to understand how, uh, what kind of parameters that you look at, um, you know, on deciding, do you want to service this country or this area or not? Because I'm sure there's like a lot of areas that need you know, your service. So how do you decide that? That's a very good question. Um, I think one of the things for Grameen Foundation is that we are really looking at sustainable solutions. So we often have opportunities to work on initiatives that we think can benefit um, <laughs> you know, maybe 10, 15,000 people, but we don't understand long-term how we would make that sustainable. Um, could, we, could we embed it in a government? Could we embed it in a private sector? For us, if we can't understand the long-term sustainability, um, it's a project that we would probably pass up on. Um, it's just not, and, and there are other groups who could do that and, and maybe do a good job and it has a benefit, but our long-term DNA is to look for something that can be long-term sustainable. We are a, an organization that has a heavy tech history, um, and so primarily we're looking at, at opportunities where we can identify ways to use technology um, in ways that can maybe leapfrog or, or find you know disruptive uh, innovations to solutions. So th that being said, you know it's it's sort of a case by case basis. Um, we almost always want a local partner on the ground. Um, be that private sector government or a, or a local entity um, who can do the implementation and who can be the long-term owner of it. And do the local partners reach out to you as, do they initiate the first contact or do you just kind of see opportunities and then reach out to the... That really can depend. Um, you know, sometimes if we, if we have an opportunity, if USAID puts out a call, we may go out and look for a particular partner. Um, other times somebody might come to us and say, um, so Musoni is, is a good example of that. They're a, the first all-digital microfinance institution in Kenya. And so they came to us um, saying, uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, we really want to build out an agricultural financing product. So can you help us think through that? So we worked with them 
um, and we had some VWB volunteers who worked with them to help think through what an agriculture finance project uh, product would look like um, and, roll, and how they could roll that out across their organization. And it's now become their most profitable product. So it works both ways a little bit. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, you guys, so much for coming. I was really, A, worried nobody would come, and then worried nobody would ask any questions. So I really appreciate it. Appreciate your time um, and the work Google is doing, because I know many things that you guys do are really contributing to the work that we do overseas. So thanks so much.